Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of all of the folks involved in this ministry, we want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, we're continuing on in our study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We're just we're going to finish the fourth chapter, right on the end of the fourth chapter, and go into the fifth chapter of that letter. So grab your Bibles, any pencil and paper, you may want to jot down some notes. It's always a good idea. And as a note of caution, I want to remind you once again, don't trust me. Test me. We're to test all things and hold fast that which is good. Anytime you listen to anybody preach or teach the word of God, make sure you're testing it against the scriptures. I mean, you're responsible to do that as the Bereans were and were commended for doing. Okay, that's that's my business note. So, Father, we just thank you that we can gather in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. We can come before you, Lord God, spending time in your word to know more about your word, the word made flesh who dwelt among us, that we might be more like Jesus Christ. That's our desire. And we know that it's your desire and it's your plan that you're conforming us into the image of your son, Christ Jesus. And we rejoice in that. And Lord, I just pray that this time together would be a blessing and an encouragement. And Lord, a tool that you can use to make us closer to him. Amen. All righty. As I said, we, did, we almost finished chapter four last week, but I wanted to save the last two verses because they're so connected to the verses that are following in, in chapter 5. So I'm going to read uh, Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32 to start. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So now as we go into chapter 5, remember that there were no chapter and verse numbers. When Paul wrote this letter, it's all one continuous uh, document, right? There's no reasonable or rational break between God and Christ forgiving us and the next thing that he writes. So Ephesians 5, 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Therefore, remember, therefore tells you what, what's connecting here, right? What we're going to read, what it's there for, right? The thing that's most powerful in causing bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander is simply unforgiveness. And if there is one thing that Christ is about, if there's one reason that God the Father sent him into the world, it's about forgiveness. Isn't that true? And remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to read from Matthew 6. He said, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. That's pretty tough. You better bear that in mind. I think uh, that's something that needs to be drilled into us. So what follows is about forgiveness. So as God and Christ forgave us, we must follow, imitate him and forgive others. Without that, that listen to me now, there is no Christianity. I mean, you can talk about all of the things, but it's about that. Church buildings don't matter. Music and praise groups don't matter. Religious holidays don't matter. Tithing, giving, it doesn't matter. Teaching a Sunday school class and speaking in tongues, none of that matters because forgiveness is the demonstration of God's love, and it's always about love. For God so loved the world. You know this verse. Right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's about God. And this is, that's what about God. His love is demonstrated by the fact that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, for our forgiveness. But this is about us, what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak with the tongues of men, and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge and, 
and I have all the faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And I may give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Christianity is about love. I mean, we have built so much tradition, or for over, over 2,000 years, we have continued to build the traditions of men, the traditions of the elders, and make Christianity about this and that, but it's about love. Now, Paul's spirit-led and spirit-breathed statement that we are to imitate God is not written to be an encouragement or a suggestion. It is a holy commandment from the throne of God. It's not a suggestion, okay? Therefore, we need to be really clear about this, follower or imitator or something else. The King James Bible in this verse says, as do a number of other translations, that we are to be followers. So before I go on, I want to just let you know that the Greek word that's used there, and it's only used a number, a small number of times in the New Testament, it is mimetes, mimetes, okay? And that's where the English word mimic comes from. That's where it originates, all right? A mimic, you know what a mimic is, okay? And that means, especially in this instance, to take on the appearance or resemble closely what or who you are mimicking or imitating, which is about trying to follow the manner, style, character, etc., of the one you're trying to imitate. And shouldn't that be what we're doing? So, but I want to let, look at the possibilities here. Because like I said, the King James says followers, the New American Standard, which I use, and I, I think the ESV also says to be imitators, all right? There are four things I want to look at during the study that have to do with this. When you talk about being like something else, the first one is a counterfeit. Right? A counterfeit, in order to be a successful counterfeit, has to be a perfect imitation of what you're trying to do. But that, of course, is not good. A follower or a disciple or finally a bond servant. Those are the four things, right? So let's look at the world's practice. You may know, you may know this if you're going to be an imitator of. Have you ever heard of identity theft? Isn't that somebody being an imitator? Isn't that somebody trying to counterfeit your, your, your personality, your being, right? And they're both, whether you're talking about identity theft or counterfeiting, you're talking about theft. You're talking about the work of thieves. Well, who is the master thief? My lovely bride over here said Satan. She didn't say it very loud, but she said it, all right. Both of those evils are about replacing the truth with a lie. That's what a counterfeit is. You're replacing the truth, the true thing, with a false thing, a lie. Both require that it looks like the original, like the real thing. I mean, you know, if it doesn't look like the real thing, what? how successful is it going to be? Think about this. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5.5. 5. But Satan goes about as a roaring lion, as Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5 eight, That's an imitation, okay? And it should never be a successful one in your life. We are the sheep of his pasture, it says in Psalm 100 and verse 3, right? But we're warned about wolves in sheep's clothing in, in Matthew chapter 7, 15. That's the imitation, all right? The counterfeit. Jesus is... And we now are the light of the world. It says that in John 8, 12. It says it in uh, Matthew 5, 14. But Satan disguises himself as an angel of light in 2 Corinthians 11, 14. You see this? I mean, all of these things, these are Satan's attempt to counterfeit the truth and replace the truth with a lie. It all comes down to this. God has promised to make us just like Jesus. That's Romans 8.29. That's the great promise. Whom he foreknew, he has 
he has predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. God the Father is in the process of making us look just like Jesus. The father of lies says out of his dark heart, I will make myself like the most high God. Isaiah 14, 14. I mean, this is really important that you get this because you, you have to be on guard. You have to be on guard about what's going on here. So much of the New Testament is about this, about false prophets, false teachers, about false doctrines. you got to get this right. Now, I said that the counterfeit requires appearance. It's got to look like the real thing, right? What it looks like. Jesus said, however, but he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. John 10, 2, 3, and 4. You know, we walk by faith and not by sight. And faith, of course, comes by hearing. Okay? You have to know the voice of Jesus Christ. I, Satan can dress things up and he can make them really look good. As a matter of fact, he seems to be more concerned with how good something looks than God the Father was. I mean, God the Father sent Jesus Christ, and it says in Isaiah 53, he had no appearance that men should be attracted to him. Meanwhile, the church today, it seems like that's all they're concerned about is making the, the things of the church, the buildings, the more and more attractive to men. Beware of counterfeits. Okay? And then after the counterfeiters, there's, there's followers. Now, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? I pray that you are. That's a good thing. How many followers do you have on social media? How many followers, friends do you have on, on Facebook? Do you really even know them? Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, Matthew 4, 18 and 19. So Jesus was calling people to follow him, all right? Praise God, I believe he called me to follow him, and I trust he's called you to follow him. But now in Matthew 4, it says this, Large crowds followed him, followed Jesus, from Galilee and the Decapolis in Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Multitudes followed Jesus. Remember when he fed the 5,000? These were people that were following him. They all ate and were satisfied. That's what it says in Matthew 14, 20. Oh, and now a large crowd was following and pressing in on him, on Jesus, when he healed the woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years. Remember that? A large crowd. Multitudes of followers. But at the end, the multitudes were crying out in front of a place called the pavement, crucify him. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they himself, themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. John 6, 24 to 26. If you're following Jesus, what's your motivation? Why are you doing that? Yeah, we'll get to that, right? Thousands of followers right after Jesus ascended into heaven, right? Remember, there were thousands. But then right after Jesus ascended into heaven, after he'd been crucified, died, and had been buried, the believers gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem, devoting themselves to prayer. There were about 120, it says. So they went from thousands to 120? Well, why? Because they saw the price of following Christ. Are you willing to pay the price to follow Jesus Christ? Okay, so those are followers. And then, of course, you have disciples. Now, that most magnificent of teaching was, was 
Jesus to the disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 1. This was the word, the word of God made flesh who dwelt among us, who was training his disciples in righteousness. That's what it says in 2 Timothy 3.16. He says, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So gathered, Jesus had gathered his disciples. That's what it says. Not, not the hangers-on, not the followers. He gathered his disciples and was training them. He was preparing his disciples for the task that he was calling them to. To be the light of the world, and the salt of the earth. Jesus was training them to fulfill the ministry they were about to embark on. Then it says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance to Christ of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. Okay, did you get that? God, he, he manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Christ in every place. We bring the knowledge of him in every place. That's our ministry. Well, we, we, need, to, we need to mimic Christ in order to do that. We need to think like him. We need to talk like him. We need to act like him. But above all, we need to love like him. So they had to first be taught to change the very way that they thought, as we do. We, we have to change the way we think. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. You know, how many times did Jesus say, well, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Where have they heard it said? From the religious leaders and the religious teachings of those Jews. Not from Scripture. Not from it, wasn't. it was from the tradition of the elders, the tradition of men. Had not Jesus said in the Gospel of Mark in the seventh chapter, he said, how nicely you set aside the commandments of God in order to hold fast to your traditions. So they had to be chained, taught to think differently. They had to go from the practice of religion to the intimacy of relationship. Now you think about that, right? To be a child of God the Father, Abba. That's the whole idea. I mean, God sent Jesus into the world to die in our place that we might be reconciled to him, that we might be able to call him father. It's about a relationship with God. That's what Christianity is about. And it's a relationship based on love, not on works, lest any man should boast. So a disciple has to learn how to learn. Okay? Uh, the disciples came and said to Jesus, why do you speak to them, talking to followers? Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Matthew 13, verses 10 to 10 and 11. You see, it's based on, you have to have that right relationship with Jesus Christ if you're going to know the things of Jesus Christ. It's about commitment. I want to tell you something about a disciple. I, I don't think we hear enough about this today in the church. A, dis, a disciple requires one thing to have. Oh, it's good to have a Bible, yes. Yes, it's a good thing to have directions to the building. What must a disciple absolutely have to have in order to be a disciple? A master. A master. I mean, it's always, that's a relationship. A follower doesn't have to have a relationship. But a, a disciple is, it has to have a relationship. It's based on having a master. A master that is training you, teaching you. And by the way, I want to tell you this again, because there's so much corruption going on in the church. That is not, a disciple does not need a mentor. A mentor is not a master. A mentor, by the way, which comes from Greek mythology, is about somebody that advises you and gives you suggestions on how you should live. You may want to write this down. Jesus Christ is not giving you, he is not giving you suggestions. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
You need to have that right relationship with Jesus Christ. And I promise you that, yes, it is a loving relationship. But he has to be the master in that relationship, not an advisor. Okay? Think about this now. It's about commitment. Discipleship is about commitment. Even disciples can have a limit. Think about what it says in John chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 60 and 66. And you really should go read the whole thing. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. It's about a commitment. You have to, it's about a master. It's about obeying Jesus Christ. And his word is not difficult to obey. It's a blessing to us. But that leads us finally to the last one I wanted to talk about is bond servants. Remember? So I said there are counterfeiters, there are followers, there are disciples, but then there are on the bond servants. Okay. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. That's the, that's the truth, right? He came to set the captives free. And having do, done so, we are free indeed. You've been set free. It says, now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17. We have liberty. But a bondservant is one, and I'm going to read to you from Exodus 21, verses 5 and 6, because this explains what a bondservant is. But if the slave, that servant, plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out as a free man. Then his master shall bring him to God, and then he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. You have to choose to serve God. You have to choose that, and you have to choose to serve him forever. That's a bond servant. Now, you know, I'm going to read the first verse of Revel the book of Revelation because I believe, indeed, we are in the perilous last days and we are closer to that book of Revelation than any generation in the past. We certainly are a day closer to the coming of the Lord than we were yesterday. You think about it. So in the first verse, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place, he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. A bondservant is somebody who is chosen to serve. This may be an oversimplification of what I just spent a lot of time on, but think about this. Followers often follow because of what they can get, right? Bread, signs and wonders. That's, you know, you go to the scriptures, you'll see a lot of people follow Jesus because of the bread they got, because of the signs and wonders that they were seeing. Disciples, on the other hand, will seek Jesus for what they can learn. That's why, I mean, you should have a burning desire to learn from the Lord. But a bond servant, they are with Jesus for what they can give, to give him. Okay? That's the deal. So are you a follower? Are you a disciple? Or are you a bondservant? And I pray you're not a counterfeit. A lot of people are counterfeit and they don't even realize it because they're, the, the things that they're doing are not Christianity. It's not about the love of God. Okay. So when it said, therefore, be, be imitators of, of God as beloved children and walk in love, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. As Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice for God. I want to tell you something. Jesus, when he was calling people, he called them to follow him, he called them and he started to disciple them, he called them to be bond servants, he said, you better count the cost. You better count the cost. Have you, do they even sing I Surrender All in your, in your congregation anymore? That's the most beautiful song, I Surrender All, because that's what God demands of you, that you surrender all. 
It all belongs to him. You belong to him. You were purchased with a price. You are not your own. You have to get that and you have to get it joyfully. That's not a burden. That's the blessing because he takes care of what is his. Is that your heart's attitude? Is to give, to love others without restriction? Is your love a giving love? You have to, if you're going to be an imitator of Jesus, you have to walk like him. You have to talk like him. Do you have to look like him? No, but you got to sound like him. Let me ask you a question. Do you know what Jesus looks like? The answer to that question, I'm going to tell you, is no, you don't. Not if you're watching from this earth. You don't know what he looks like. Do you know what Jesus sounds like? If you don't, you don't know Jesus. Because your relationship with him is based on what he says for you, to you. And you are supposed to know his voice. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God, the word of Christ. I pray that you hear his voice, that you act upon his voice, that you learn to joyfully do what God tells you to do. Because that is the blessing of being a bondservant. And that's the blessing of being a true follower of Jesus Christ. That's the blessing of being a true disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not, about, it's not a matter of church membership. It's a matter, are you, is your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? Praise God. Father, I, I pray. I pray, Lord, that we would grow in a burning desire to be more and more like your son, Christ Jesus that we would rejoice in the work that you are doing in our lives, molding us and shaping, burning away the dross, burning away the bad things in our life, Lord, that we might look more like Jesus, that we might act more like Jesus, that we might talk more like Jesus. That as you sent him into the world to be a witness of your love, Father, that we would also be that witness to your love, that people would see your son Christ Jesus in us and through us, and be drawn to him, that they might come to you, Father. For Jesus Christ said that he is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the light. Life. And nobody comes to, the, to you, Father, except through him. So we praise you and thank you so much for the gift that you've given us, Father. The gift of your son, Christ Jesus. Oh, what a cost. Well, until next week, I pray that you think about these things and that you would grow closer and closer and closer to Jesus, that you might be closer and closer to the Father, and that it all might be powered by His Holy Spirit at work in your life. God bless you, and goodbye until next week. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, Of your mighty love.